I am very honored to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Lisa Carey is the Richardson and Marilyn Jacobs Pryor Distinguished Professor in Breast Cancer Research in the UNC Department of Medicine, Division of Hematology Oncology. Dr. Carey joined the UNC faculty and Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center in 1998. In 2012, she was appointed Chief of the Division of Hematology Oncology and Physician-in-Chief of North Carolina Cancer Hospital. She is Medical Director of the UNC Breast Center and has long-standing wonderful research interests in the clinical application of laboratory findings in breast cancer with a particular interest in the clinical implications of different molecular subtypes of breast cancer. Uh, today, she's going to address uh, a topic that is of great interest. It's new, and there's a lot to be said, and she's an expert. It is called the Molecular Genetics of Breast Cancer, Where Are We in 2014? Uh, welcome, Dr. Carey. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Hi, everybody. So I have the uh, pleasure of uh, trying to talk about molecular genetics um, uh, and uh, to a clinical audience. And so bear with me. I'll do the best I can. Remember, I'm a doctor, so I'm going to um, I try and think in terms of clinical applications all the time, and I know you do too. So we'll, we'll try and keep it there. But the fact is, a lot of what we're learning now is not in the clinic, but we hope it will be soon. So, so let's go ahead. So the first, of course, is the obvious question, what is breast cancer? So before we talk about biology, let's just talk about definitions. So malignant growth or a tumor resulting from the division of abnormal cells, it says in the breast, but as you know, we really mean from the breast because a tumor that goes from the breast into the liver is still breast cancer. And that is a, something that sometimes patients, uh, I know this is a very educated audience, but that often takes some time for people to kind of grasp. So it's breast cancer if it came from cells that comprise the breast, if it can divide and grow without normal controls, right? Dividing and growing is normal. All the cells of your body do that. But if it does it without the normal controls, that's part of the hallmark of cancer. And if it's able to invade other tissues, right? Get into places it does not belong. Okay, so here's the problem. So these are what are called H and E's. This is what your pathologist looks at under the microscope. So let me see if I've got a pointer. So this is a grade one cancer. This is a grade three cancer. These are considered sort of aggressive appearing. This is more benign appearing. And that's the kind of information we get from our pathology reports, which you know people hope is useful. But now we're going to have a quick quiz. <laughs> All right, so who crosses the road to get away from this guy, raise your hand. <laughs> a couple of people. Who crosses the road to get away from this guy? <laughs> All right. So, so that's the problem. Just like people, cancers can be deceiving. So they can look more benign, but actually be aggressive, or they can look more aggressive but either themselves be relatively indolent and non, not able to metastasize or to progress rapidly, or they can be sensitive to therapy. We're not good at picking out the bad ones. That's where molecular tests are giving us real information. So the other key part that's happened in the last, I would say, decade or so is the fact that clinicians like me, like Carrie, like Tim, are working more and more with scientists routinely. And so that partnership has actually been a real benefit for, I think, all of us. Maybe not fruit flies directly, but indirectly. <laughs> so molecular biology 101, so forgive me for, for just a minute, because it is important as we talk about some of these things to remember which parts of, of the process we're talking about. These are, this is normal cellular processes. Remember, you have genes the blueprint, right, which become RNA, the RNA then becomes your proteins, and there's, a, there's a, a linear effect there. You can go wrong, and cancers have aberrations at any part in that pathway. And so if you start up here, these are genes, you can get mutations. 
The genes themselves can be normal, but they can get turned on or off through what are called epigenetic mechanisms. There are other genes that make RNAs that can alter what's being made by a completely different gene. They regulate what a gene is doing. You can make different proteins from the same gene. That's actually normal, but it makes it very complex. Proteins themselves can be modified, and how they get degraded can change. And we know that cancer can have impacts and effects in all of these places, which is part of the reason it's very complex. We talk about mutations, and there's a whole cottage industry about mutational analyses, but the fact is mutation is just one piece of a very long pie. That's not a very good thing, long pie. So genetic errors, so, so we just, if we go back to the, you know, to be honest, the mutational analyses are easy, so that's why they, we do them. Uh, we do know that mutations, so here's your, your double helix, here's your Watson-Crick double helix, <laughs> this is a mutation, um, at least the PowerPoint version of one. <laughs> so mu the, you can have different kinds of mutations, they can do totally different things, they don't always turn things off. For example, we know that mutations in regulatory genes can cause you to have way too many copies of HER2. That's actually the primary mechanism for HER2 positive breast cancer is too many gene copies. You also can have mutations that cause you to not make something that's important, like BRCA1. So if we just talk about genes, I'm going to also make one other sort of parenthetical comment, because I'm going to talk about two slightly different things. There are two kinds of genetics. They're different. They relate to each other, but sort of not completely. The first is the genetics of the tumor. So all cancers have abnormal DNA in one form or the other. That is one of the characteristics of being cancer. They're always deranged in one way or the other. That's why it became a cancer. And of course, that's where our targetability oftentimes comes from. There's also the genetics of the person. So be aware, as many of you are, you know, BRCA1 and 2, now PALB2, and there are others, right? That, ca that can affect your risk of getting cancer. And it, to some degree, it may affect how the cancer behaves. It also can, affect, can change the effectiveness and the side effects of therapy. So that's a whole nother category of genetics that are different. So let's talk briefly about inherited risk genes. So again, you want to look for things to blame your parents for. Here's another one. <laughs> so 5 to 10 percent of breast cancers arise in women who carry, or men in this case, uh, men who have an abnormality in BRCA1 or BRCA2. You can get it from either your mother or your father. Right? That's something that sometimes gets lost. And in this case, for many people, knowledge, in fact, is power. And the story that many of you know is the Angelina Jolie story, who's lost her mother to ovarian cancer, and a maternal aunt also is affected with the disease. She found out she carried a BRCA1 mutation and underwent a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. So that, in that case, we happen to know for these particular genes, we know we have preventive strategies for people at risk that work. Now, the guy on the right is Woody Guthridge, uh, you know, Woody Guthrie who had uh, Huntington's disease. So in that case, knowledge has not yet translated into power, um, so we have to keep that in mind. Now, this is also an evolving story, as everything is when it comes to, to medicine, blessedly so. Um, we know that 5 to 10 percent of breast cancers are associated with BRCA1 or 2 mutations, but again, there's a whole bunch of people, so we have women who have BRCA1 or 2 mutations who never get cancer and they live long, healthy lives and die at 108 of getting hit by a truck. We also have lots of women who don't have any identifiable underlying genetic abnormality who get breast cancer, and we don't really understand either of those stories very well. So why don't all people who carry BRCA1 and 2 mutations get breast cancer or ovarian cancer. I mean, the fact is that even with what we call highly penetrant genes, which are genes where there is a very strong association with getting a particular disease, there are things that modify that risk. We don't really understand that part of it all that well, but we know that other genes may influence that risk. Other exposures may influence that risk. And there is some people who are sort of mathematically astute who say that a lot of non what we consider non-inherited breast cancer or sporadic breast cancer or non-BRCA breast cancer, whatever term you want to use, is actually can be explained through complicated models of genes that interact with each other that you need a couple of them, 
plus some kind of exposure. So it's actually a much more complicated dance between your genetic makeup and your environmental exposures that may cause this. I mean, consider it. I have, I mean, we've all known people who smoke three packs a day and never got any tobacco-related diseases, right? I mean, we know that there are, there are things that we don't understand very well about why one person gets a disease and another doesn't, regardless of their underlying known risk profile. So now let's talk about, so that was the <laughs> genetics of the person, right? Now we're going to talk about the genes and the cancer, which usually have little resemblance to the, um, the person. So mutations and other aberrations that arise in the tumor with the rest of the cells in the body being normal for that particular gene. So this is the more common kind, and all cancers have them. So traditionally, you know, there's been lots of scientists looking at you know, favorite gene number one, favorite gene number two, whatever. And the problem that we ran into was this one. So many of you know the sort of parable about the blind, the blind men and the elephant, right? They're all touching different parts of the elephant. They think they're touching something that's different because they can't see the whole thing. That's been the problem with cancer biology and, and science for many, many years. And we're just now developing the techniques to get past that where we can look at a portrait. We can look at the whole picture. So let me introduce a term. Who here has heard the term omics? Okay, a significant proportion of people. That's a great one. So omics is, is what's called a neologism, a, a kind of a made-up new word, and it refers to the study of a biologic process but in a collective way. So there's a bunch of, well, you know, ohms, right? So genome, proteome, I should have kinome in here because I think I'm going to talk about it in a second, metabolome. My favorite, personal favorite, the punome. <laughs> That is an actual term that it is to. Swear to God, there were people doing metabolites in stool to look at colon cancer markers, and they actually called it the punome. <laughs> so the genome is the best study so far. So I'm going to talk about that primarily, although I'll get into some proteomic stuff at the end. So remember, cancers all have mutations, alternative functions. There's typically multiples, you know, of one form, aberrations, and the other. Genomics is studying the expression of large numbers of genes simultaneously. So large and simultaneous are the key parts of that. So it's actually hard to do. So the techniques and the technology for doing this were developed in the, around in the 90s. Um, they relied on things that didn't even exist until the 80s, and then they were applied in the 90s. And it wasn't until pretty late in the game, doing it in actual tumors. It's easier to do things in cell lines on, on, on plastic plates than it is to do with tumors that are made up of a whole lot of stuff. And it's harder to study genes if what you're interested in are the cancer genes, but are mixed up with immune cells and stromal cells and blood vessels and all the other stuff that's in there, and some's dead and some's alive, and et cetera, et cetera. So that actually was a very tricky thing to try and get a reliable measurement when you're looking at thousands of things to make sure you're getting the thousands of things that you actually want and not thousands of something else. So uh, I have here a picture of, of my, my scientific colleague and partner in crime, Chuck Peru, who you know, is down the road here, who is a PhD scientist, but I threaten him regularly that I'm going to stick a stethoscope around his neck and make him come see patients with me because he is a very medically oriented scientist. He has a sister who's a surgeon and stuff, so he actually, he, he comes by it naturally. But he actually was the first to do this successfully in human breast cancer, and that was the first solid tumor. It's been done by lots of people now, but he was the first, so about 10 to 15 years ago, using this kind of, of technology. See, that's a gene chip thing on the right. You can see it's, it's you know, not much bigger than a penny, right? So these little things. And what you get is, do you see the red and green? That's essentially what you get from a microarray chip. Every dot, black, red, or green, is one gene. So, you know, you find your favorite gene in there. <laughs> This is what you get. I just took a picture, so this is not, this is not meaningful in and of itself, but this is the kind of thing you get. This is a snapshot of a piece. Each of these is a gene. Now realize the first ones of these that he worked with had 5,000 genes on them. You get 5,000 rows times I don't know how many uh, columns. So I, you know, I don't know what you do with this in figuring out what breast cancers are doing, so thank God for computers. <laughs> 
So what the computer basically does is take a whole lot of stuff that you can't really tell what it is, and it turns it into a picture for you, right? It identifies, in this case, you're looking across all these genes, you know, several thousand frequently, what's up, what's turned on, what's turned off, and what seems to be going on and off in concert. What are clustered together? What affect each other? Because that's the key thing. What's regulating each other? So this is what you get. And I actually borrowed this slide from Chuck, who is a great lover of surrealist art, so it's actually kind of wacky already. So when you do that with breast cancer, you get molecular subtypes of breast cancer. This doesn't tell you how it's going to behave, and it was not designed to tell you how to behave. Subsequent studies did that. This is our breast cancer is different from each other. When we say breast cancer, is that a meaningful concept? The short answer is not really. So what you get, regardless of what system you use to identify, whatever system you want to use, you will get subtypes, molecular subtypes of breast cancer. And there's lots of labs losing lots of different techniques to do this, and they all find the same thing. So that's very reassuring to those of us who are in the clinic, because that means it's probably real. So it also means breast cancer is not one disease. It is a family of biologically distinct diseases, and we really have to think about it in that way, and increasingly are thinking about it in that way, as you know. So now we get to the, you know, what, the, what do the clinicians say when, you know, in 2000, Chuck Peru publishes this famous paper in Nature and gets in, and we're like, yeah, so what? Well, how, does, how does that help my patients? So, some of you may have heard of the Carolina Breast Cancer Study. It's a very famous, it's one of the largest case control studies, started in the early 90s. It's, it's housed here. There's been three phases of it, and it's given us a lot of the information that we know about molecular and other epidemiologic traits. There's been hundreds of papers written out of the Carolina Breast Cancer Studies, which you know, came out of our School of Public Health here, because it did two things. One is it was population-based, so it's, a, it's, it's not selected. It's what happens in a regular population. They went to, to, to 24 counties in North Carolina, and they just collected information. Every patient that got a cancer, they were going to go find them and put them in a study or not. There was a deliberate selection process. They oversampled African-American women because they wanted to make sure they got every African-American woman in the study that they could because traditional studies underrepresent women of color, and they underrepresent young women. So they said, we have to get more information about breast cancer in young women and women of color. So they deliberately created a sampling structure that had them in addition to a more, more conventional uh, group of postmenopausal uh, white women. This study has given us a ton of information. I can tell you phase three, which took the information we got from phases one and two, has now completed, last October, 3,000 more women, again, focus on, in this case, we have a focus on triple negative as well as uh, uh, breast cancer in women of color and young women. For the first time, we collected treatment information prospectively. So as the woman is getting treated, we know. We know what drugs she got. We know what's happening to her and what happened to her. It's being collected. And we know we have information whether she took the drugs. We know what trouble she had, what side effects she had. I mean, all that information is now baked in to this study. So, so stay, stay tuned. Now, what do we learn from phases one and two that informed what we've done with phase three? First is, OK, if breast cancer isn't one disease, then saying what causes breast cancer I don't know how you answer that, right? Here's data that supports the fact that we have to revisit the concept of breast cancer risk. So if you look at ER positive, HER2 negative breast cancer, the most common kind of breast cancer, typically a luminal breast cancer, and you compare that to basal-like breast cancer, which makes up the majority of triple negative breast cancer, you can see traditional risk factors are really kind of different, right? So some of them, like having early menarche, um, and being obese is a worse risk factor for basal-like than it is for luminal breast cancer. Even more sort of intriguingly or scarily, depending on how you look at it, some of the risk factors that we think of as being protective, like, you know, multiparity and having, I mean, there's all these things that we thought we knew about breast cancer. The effect is actually reversed in basal-like compared to luminal. So we really have to rethink 
what do we think about how, what causes breast cancer because it's going to be different here. Similar, breastfeeding, you know, people are like, yeah, breastfeeding is pretty good, but, you know, so it has a little effect, it's good to do. Actually, it seems to be, have a much bigger effect in, in preventing basal-like breast cancer. That's a good thing, right? That's a prevention strategy that we can, we can leverage. We also have to revisit behavior. So what does it mean to have one of these different kinds of breast cancers? So we do know a couple of things. One is there are some better prognosis breast cancers. This is a, these are called Kaplan-Meier curves. This is proportion of people free from relapse. So every time it goes down, then, then a certain proportion of people are really, affected. this is obviously a very poor risk uh, group of, of patients. But there's some that are better, right? Fewer of them have relapsed and some that are worse, right? In addition, you can see this is the number of months since diagnosis. You know, HER2 positive breast cancer, this is b before Herceptin, and basal-like, the triple negative ones, they relapse more, but they also relapse earlier, right? They're doing it in this time phrase. Then they kind of level off. These guys you're seeing luminal A, so luminal B, you know, the, the luminal B, this is a luminal or hormone receptor positive, they start to catch up once you get out here. So, amount of risk, Timing of relapse and the sites of relapse are different. Now, I'm not going to show you this because I got a better slide. So, for example, brain metastases. Much more prominent in HER2 positive and triple negative breast cancer. Bone relapse, much more prominent in, in hormone receptor positive relapse, breast cancer relapse. We do not understand this, but it is a consistent finding and it is something about the tumor and the microenvironment, right? It's the, the seed and the soil. So that's important because, as you know, there are treatments coming out, immune-directed treatments and other kinds of treatments that are really, the treatment is focused around getting the host stronger to fight off the cancer. That's very relevant. We actually already have drugs that do that, Zomata, for example, uh, Exgeva. Those affect the microenvironment but also make the microenvironment more hostile to the cancer as a way of controlling the cancer. That's a good thing. Okay, so what about applications? So applied omics, 50-year-old, otherwise healthy woman, she's just been diagnosed with metastatic ER-positive HER2-negative breast cancer. So this is a, there's a multi-gene assay, it's called the Oncotype DX, that we use to predict recurrence in tamoxifen-treated node-negative breast cancer. This is how we use it. Women who have a low recurrence score can just get away with anti-estrogen therapy. Higher ones need chemotherapy in addition. There is a, a uh, commercial assay that lets you do intrinsic sub subtyping, again for prognosis. This is in early breast cancer. And there's several of them, and again, this is, a, this is a commercial thing, right? This isn't something universities are gonna do on their own, and there are several, they're all expensive, they all have limitations, but they also have some worth. What about metastatic disease? Well, they might have a role in metastatic decision making. That's a, that's a question mark. Low recurrence score, high recurrence score. You can see there, the high recurrence score is very heterogeneous. This is the group that we use the recurrence score in. And it is prognostic in metastatic disease, but even more intriguingly, and this is a very small study and needs to be confirmed, but it looked like you might be able to use it in an ER positive, HER2 negative breast cancer patient to help decide whether you should use chemo first or use antiestrogens first. That would be actually a helpful thing for those of us in, 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 in the clinical realm. So here's the caveat emptor about biologic tests. This is a real patient from my clinic, 45-year-old woman, locally recurrent triple negative breast cancer. She went to an overseas company. She had, as it turns out, more money than sense, and got <laughs> extensive molecular testing, including next-gen sequencing, tumor vaccine preparation, circulating tumor cell quantitation, ended up with recommendations to use mitomycin C, which is a very strange thing to use in breast cancer, taxane, that would be okay, and Avastin. Um, to avoid doxorubicin and avoid platinum agents. Her mutational analysis showed a bunch of mutations that are uh, uh, of uncertain, P10 and P53, of uncertain clinical relevance. She has a mouse avatar being created in New Jersey to have the drugs tested on her mouse. Um, so the question she came to is, should we use her molecular diagnostic test to guide her therapy? Now, she'd had all this done before I saw her. So just remember, there are tests, there are rules of the road for, for assays as there are for drugs. You need to know the assay, the test is good before you apply it. I mean, it's, it's very simple. A bad assay is as bad as a bad drug. It has to be accurate. It has to differentiate cancers in a meaningful way. And you have to know that you actually will help the patient by using the test. 
And for all of these things that she had done, none had met that criterion. So this is a partnership, and this is a key part that my last few slides is going to be about the partnership between the patient and the researcher and trying to get smarter in the future. So this is a study that I had the pleasure of designing and running, which looked at neoadjuvant therapy in HER2-positive breast cancer. A couple of things are key. Every patient in that study allowed herself to undergo a research biopsy. Every one, 100%, and they were wonderful. We had no trouble accruing to the study, and this is how it helped us. We found that the HER2-enriched subtype of breast cancer had very high responsiveness. It didn't matter which drugs we gave. That's actually a meaningful thing. It's not just the treatment. Sometimes it's the underlying disease that matters the most. This is a very good response rate with a drug regimen that's very easily tolerated. We also found a bunch of other things that also contributed to this. Immune cells in the tumor, certain mutations, and abnormal cellular growth pathways. We maybe should take that into account when we're attributing you know, drug A versus drug B. There's a bunch of non-drug things that affect how the cancer responds. We similarly, in triple negative breast cancer, there are some targets that we think about. We have drugs that inhibit EGFR. We've done clinical trials testing them in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Most of the time, it didn't work. When patients let us do biopsies before and after taking the, the drugs, we got a sense of why. Sometimes the gene wasn't there. We thought it would be, and it wasn't. Sometimes it was there, and it wasn't working. Sometimes it looked like it should have worked, and it didn't. The tumor knew some way around what we were doing. This is what it does. It reprograms itself. You give a drug, and the cancer finds a back door. Oh, sorry. We did a window trial where we gave a drug, and we looked at the kinome. So we're looking at all these proteins and what they did. And everything that's green means something other than the drug target turned on. OK, so the, the, the drug only affects supposedly one thing. Look at all the other stuff that got turned on when that got turned off. That's reprogramming. So that's our problem right now. We may have to get smarter, right? We have the whack-a-mole problem. You hit one thing, and something else pops up. So we have to be rational about combining our drugs and being thoughtful about it. And a multi-pronged approach, I think, is likely with many of our thornier breast cancer types. So I just want to say thank you because it's increasingly true that this is a partnership, right? That's Sir William Osler in the top, you know, thinking deep thoughts off in his office up at Hopkins. That's not how we get better with breast cancer now. It is a partnership between the patients, the advocates, the caregivers, and all of us in order to get smarter. Thank you very much. I have some questions from the audience. Is there a greater risk of breast cancer being passed down to your daughter when it's ER positive, or is it the same risk if mother has HER2 or triple negative? Um, so triple negative has a tight association. So BRCA1, 80% of women who carry BRCA1 that they inherit, if they get breast cancer, it's triple negative. So that is being incorporated into some of the risk assessments that medical geneticists are doing. If you take away BRCA1 and 2, then it's a little less, less clear. Does the Carolina Breast Cancer Study collect data on recurrence or MET? Yes. Can other states replicate? Sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, the short answer is the, the Carolina Breast Cancer Study was a tour de force. It, pr it was present before I got here, and it in part was one of the reasons I came. Um, it was a partnership between Lineberger Cancer Center scientists, the School of Medicine clinicians, and the School of Public Health epidemiologists. And that partnership was baked in before they designed the trial. They did it together. And so you need to have an incredibly strong interdisciplinary system to design a trial like that. You also have to have investment. So CBCS was funded by the NIH, blessedly, the first couple of phases. More recently, we've had uh, uh, philanthropic support for the follow-up data, so it's NIH supported. Um, Coleman is supporting it. I mean, we've had a lot of, of, of other people who are helping, because these are expensive studies to do. 
Is there any benefit to obtaining a foundation one study when not in a clinical trial, at least not yet, with a sad face? <laughs> I have lobular hormone receptor positive HER2 negative, not responsive to chemo and AI inhibitor, which I assume means that it recurred in spite of that adjuvantly. Not BRCA, no P10, no P53, no genetic mutations. Um, so foundation one testing, I think many of us think that that approach, and, and we do this here, so we have something called UNSeq, which is next generation sequencing that's actually both germline and tumor genetics done simultaneously on cancer patients here at UNC. We all think that is the, the future, but how to get there is uncertain because of that biomarker validity thing. So you have to know, for example, that if you pick up something on a foundation one test, and you treat according to it, that that assay actually identifies the treatment correctly. And the problem is that a lot of, there's a lot of noise in the assays. Um, and so I think it's the way forward, and Foundation One has done a wonderful job with that kind of testing, but applying it and knowing that it's working is troublesome, you know, because we really don't know. For example, if you find a lung cancer mutation in a breast cancer, if you use the lung cancer drug, is it going to work the same? Um, and in fact, we know already that in some cases, we already know it does not. So there are some mutations in melanoma that in colon cancer, they, do the, the, the very, they have a very different effect and the drugs don't work. So I love the testing. I prefer that they're collecting data on what happens if you treat according to the test result. It's also more often than not in breast cancer, the, those kinds of tests will find things that are suggestive for clinical trials, but they seldom come up with something that change your treatment today. No family history, but father and grandmother had colon cancer, shared gene mutation. Uh, I don't know. So it, the, the, the trick with a family history, and, and there, are, um, there are genetic risks that cross tumor types, pancreatic, colon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's a good question for a medical geneticist who will do a detailed family tree and can actually, they typically will calculate and they will think about not just BRCA1 and 2. When you start getting into some of these other tumor types, they look for uh, you know, Lee Fraumeni syndromes and some other syndromes that can increase the risk of breast cancer, but also some other tumors. Bottom line, should patients only do genetic testing through their breast cancer center or clinical trial? You know, I think, um, well, germline genetic testing, so BRCA1 and 2 type testing can be done conventionally in the clinic um, and, and is, is common and, and typically well done. I think we like it when geneticists can be involved in the conversation about what to do with the information. Um, and particularly disseminating to family members. Uh, if you're talking about genetic testing on the tumor, I, think, I personally think that it needs to be done in a setting where they're collecting outcome data, where they're collecting information about what happened, did it work, et cetera. Uh, you said one last question? I'm holding one last question. What percentage of BRCA positive patients never get cancer? So um, in general, uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers have a 50 to 80 percent lifetime risk of getting cancer if they live an otherwise long and healthy life. We already know that some of those mutations, that some mutations have a high, you know, go up or down, um, but just in general, that's about the risk. Thank you very much.